on behalf of the Hotchkiss Library of Sharon, I'm so happy you've joined us um, this evening. I'm Gretchen Hochmeister, the library's executive director. We ask you to please uh, put your microphone on the mute setting now if you haven't done so already. And please keep the microphone muted during the first half of our program. We invite your questions in the second half of the program. So feel free to type them at any time in the chat box or um, you may wait to raise your hand, either your real hand or your Zoom hand um, during the Q&A later on. And then we will call on you and unmute you so you can ask your question. When I checked our registration online today and I saw how many folks had signed up for this event, I have to admit I was both happy and a little bit sad. I wish that this was not a topic that was affecting so many of us, but that's not the reality. We've collectively lived through an extremely stressful 20 months, and it's clear that the pandemic is still hanging around for a while. Its effects will be with us for a very long time. And of course, during this shared experience, our regular lives have continued, albeit in different ways. So all the other things that certainly can influence our mental health at any time did not go away. So I'm very pleased that Dr. Richard O'Connor is here with us this evening. A graduate of Trinity College in Hartford, he received his MSW and PhD from the University of Chicago, followed by postgraduate work at the Institute for Psychoanalysis and the Family Institute. For 14 years, Dr. O'Connor was executive director of the Northwest Center for Family Services and Mental Health, overseeing the treatment of almost a thousand patients per year. He's a practicing psychotherapist right here in Sharon, and Dr. O'Connor has written numerous books, including Rewire, Happy at Last, Undoing Perpetual Stress, and of course, Undoing Depression. In this new, completely revised, updated third edition, he addresses recent developments and controversies in mental health treatment, and he calls this book The Humane Guide to Recovery. Dr. O'Connor will speak about the book for a few minutes, then he'll answer some questions that I've prepared, and then we'll open the discussion up for your questions. Welcome. Thank you, Gretchen. Um, I, I, I hope I'm coming through loud and clear. Um, so I, I thought I'd start by just talking about why I wrote this book, and that's always seems to be a good place to start. This is the third edition. I wrote the first edition maybe um, 20 some years ago, when I was executive director of the Housatonic Center, the Northwest Center for Mental Health. Um, and we would get four or five new people in every week. And we had a case conference every week where we would review these cases and try to find the best fit between our staff and, and, and the new uh, uh, client. Uh, so, I heard about all these cases every week. And what I heard over and over frustrated me. I, I heard about people who had been suffering from depression for some time, but they didn't realize it. They, they just had concluded that their life stinks or that uh, they're a failure or that there's no hope. And um, they came to us because they were in a crisis. Their depression had been going on for some time, but they didn't know it. And in the meantime, it had really wreaked havoc in their lives because of the bad decisions they'd made, the bad habits they'd developed, uh, the destructive effect on their relationships, all that kind of thing. So I wanted to find a way to reach people if it was possible before depression had had all that impact on them. And also at the same time I was, I was writing, I, I got to say, I was really inspired by William Styron, um, his book, Darkness Visible. He was the first, I think the first known person to sort of come out of the closet and talk about his depression. And I thought if, if he could do it, I could too, because I, I wanted to write something from my own point of view, both as a professional and as a sufferer from depression. Um, it's, it's been a, a challenge all my life, but uh, something I've, I've learned to live with and I think I've led a useful and productive life. So Styron, so another thing, another reason why I wrote the book I, is that I was kind of fed up with so much that was being written about depression. It was most of the books that were out then were pu pushing some 
particular point of view. Cognitive behavior therapy was very popular at the time, but uh, I found that there was no single theory that really could explain depression. Um, I'd been trained in systems theory and I found that much more helpful. Uh, the idea that depression is a disease of the mind, the brain, how we think, how we feel, the body, our relationships, every aspect of our lives. And I simply at that time wanted to put the principles of good psychotherapy into a usable form. One major idea was that we, we have an unconscious. We all do have an unconscious. And part of that unconscious is a set of defense mechanisms. And those defenses are, are habits of thought or, or feeling that we learn in an effort to protect ourselves from difficult feelings or facts. They distort reality so that we can't really identify the source of our trouble and we can't see how we sabotage ourselves. I did borrow a lot from cognitive behavioral therapy because it is, um, it has a lot of truth in it. And in later edi editions, I, I've added a, a great deal from trauma theory and, and mindfulness practice. This latest edition has, has me going back and revising, unfortunately, uh, much of the optimism I, I had in previous editions for antidepressant medication because it's become obvious that they don't work as advertised. And it's come out that much of the research is deeply flawed. We've been sold on this idea that we have a, a, a chemical, that depression is a result of a chemical imbalance in the brain, except that nobody can really explain what that chemical imbalance is supposed to be. And it turns out that it's really just been a marketing ploy. Um, so I put more emphasis in this last edition on self-help and on finding good therapy and on fighting the stigma of depression because stigma really reinforces the whole dreary business. Um, one piece of good news to come out of all this is that more and more people have been willing to come out of the closet and share their own experiences with depression. And I think that's very good news for everyone. Uh, a great part of, the, uh, of, of depression is self-blame, feeling inadequate, feeling unworthy. And I think that uh, prejudice attitudes really reinforce that feeling. And the more we can get over those kinds of prejudices, the better off we're all gonna be. So that's, that's what led me to write all this. That's great, thanks. The, um, you um, mentioned, I believe in the book, um, uh, the power of mindfulness. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit about uh, the connection between mindfulness and um, you know, good mental health and it, what the science says about mindfulness? Because it becomes such a, a popular, popular thing. I mean, you can get an app, you can do it on your own, you can go to yeah. a class. Yeah, yeah. I can actually recommend an app. Um, one good site is 10% um, Happier um, uh, by Dan, I forget. 10% um, Happier, this fellow is, was a uh, broadcaster for ABC News, I think, national, national correspondent, had a full-blown panic attack on live television for all the world to see. And he decided he was going to be a good journalist and research what was known about this kind of thing. So he put together this website, this book first, 10% Happier, and this, this website, which gathers together a lot of tools, a lot of, a lot of good speakers, a lot of relaxation exercises, a lot of stress training, a lot of sort of reshaping your thoughts about stress, anxiety, and depression. And um, I think he's got some good things on it. But any, I mean, mindfulness is really learning how to find a calm center in the middle of all, all the stress. And one of the, th and there's a lot of good solid research to back it up. It's not just a fad. Um, people have found that mindfulness is practice, regular mindfulness practice is 
good for anxiety and depression, of course, but also good for uh, asthma, uh, for skin diseases, for uh, autoimmune diseases, um, uh, all, all kinds of stress-related conditions. And mindfulness practice is very simple. It really just is, you know, learning to watch your thoughts instead of being caught up in your thoughts. It's really taking five, 10 minutes, half an hour every day to sort of center yourself without distractions, get yourself to a calm place. I like, I like sometimes to uh, instruct people to find a pleasant scene from their childhood, something that, that, that's very vivid to them and take themselves back there and slow their breathing and just learn to relax and let the thoughts flow off. Part of the problem with depression is we have these incessant worries. We have these nagging thoughts, the, this guilt, the self-criticism, this fear, this, oh my God, I won't be able to stand it. We have to learn to let those slide off like water on a Gore-Tex tent. It, the, the, you know, the, we have, the mindfulness gives us this tent and we, we can learn that the thoughts don't have to get to us. We don't, they don't have to run away with us. So we can end up with our heart rate slowed, our, our blood pressure down um, and feeling much better about our depression and the world we live in. Great, thank you. Um, can you talk a little bit more about the myth of chemical imbalance that you touched upon? Because I think we've all, you know, we've been inundated with all the advertisements, right? And all the books and everything. Yeah. And we know yeah. people who've, who've, you know, taken antidepressants who, who say that they've helped them. Yeah, the, the, the research on antidepressants is really quite confusing. I mean, I, you know, let me say this. I recommend to patients that they try antidepressants because they're all, they often work. Um, it's just that we don't know when they're going to work. We don't know why uh, Elevil is going to be good for Joe and uh, uh, Prozac is going to be good for Jane. We, we have no idea about that, although people are looking into it. The truth is that every antidepressant helps about 55% of the, of the people who try it. Hmm. The problem is that placebos help about 50% of the people who try them. Um, so it's very hard to, to know how much of the active ingredient in the, in, in the medication is, is really working here. And the research has been very flawed. It's all based on recovery in, in the research is based on uh, your rating on a simple little 10 point rating scale. It's really vastly simple minded. Um, recovery in the research is measured at the end of three months uh, when three months is just a drop in the bucket in the lifetime of most people who have depression. Um, the research has been very, very biased to favor the drugs. Um, so, and this whole idea of the chemical imbalance, the idea that um, SSRIs somehow restore the serotonin level or the norepinephrine level in the synapses in our brains, uh, that hasn't been able to be proved. Um, it's a hypothesis, it's, maybe it's a good hypothesis, but it's, it's not proven. That's the source of the chemical imbalance idea. And we don't really know if the, if, the, if the medications affect that or not. So they help some people some of the time and you should try it if, 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 you, if you haven't, but be prepared for disappointment. You have, you have to do a lot more to help yourself in recovery from depression. And what about um, genetics? Are some of us um, predisposed to depression? Um, maybe that's a very complicated question uh, and nobody's really been able to sort it out. There is some research going on now about um, certain factors in our genetics that make us, that may make one drug more effective than another 
for us. And some psychiatrists have been using that kind of testing to, for, to help them prescribe. I don't know how solid it is. I, I, you know, it's, it's very hard to separate out genetics from an, the environment in, in the history of someone with depression. And what about um, the ways that depression interacts with other um, mental health issues like anxiety or, you know, how, how does one sort out all those tangled threads of um, different kinds of mental health issues? Yeah, I, I, I really think of depression and anxiety as two fingers on the same hand. They, they, they you know, all the research shows that they co-occur 50 to 60 percent of the time. If you have one, you, you're likely to have the other. We have very effective medications for anxiety. Um, they really will help. Unfortunately, they're addictive. The benzodiazepines like Xanax and Clonopin. But if you're really having a panic attacks, you, you should try them. Just not try not try very hard not to get hooked. The antidepressants don't have that kind of effect effectiveness, unfortunately. But and as far as other 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 mental health conditions, I, I think we're just beginning to understand the links with uh, between depression and and anxiety and trauma. Um, um, the links with with envi environmental stress, interpersonal stress, job stress. Uh, all the kinds of everyday things we all put up with. COVID, of course, has been a major factor. Um, and do you have some advice for um, those of us who have young adults in our families? I think, uh, you know, young, young people, teenagers, high school students, college students, you know, just as these kids were ready to sort of launch out on their own into the world in the last 20 months, their world has shrunk, you know, now it's a little better, but um, online yeah. school has been so difficult yeah. and being cut off from um, seeing their friends face to face. What can we do to support, support these kids? That's a very good question. I think we really need to encourage them to get busy, to be as active, as interactive as, as possible on the net or in, in person, you know, using uh, precautions whenever possible. I, 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 I know that a good many of my recent patients have, have, be, have developed depression as a result of the isolation of COVID. Mm -hmm. These are, well, um, I actually, I have a friend uh, who um, I just talked to last week who has, um, has always been a uh, a spark plug, really a dynamic, outgoing, ener energetic pe person. Um, unfortunately, we live in different parts of the country, so we hadn't talked in a number of months and just heard this week that he's put on 20 pounds. He's lost interest in most of the things that used to bring him joy. He's got depression. And that's one way it happens. Uh, it, it's this sort of gradual change and COVID has really in, in inspired that. It's the isolation, the feeling that you're alone. Um, many of my newer patients have, have, been, have, have never realized how much it mattered to them that they were going to work and interacting with people face to face every day and exchanging gossip and jokes and being able to put on a face and present themselves to the world. You know, COVID has allowed us to get lazy. Mm -hmm. And I think laziness, is, I shouldn't say that, but laziness is very much associated with depression. It, it, it's, it's we, we, we get lax. We don't hold ourselves to the high, the standards that we used to. And we give up and sink into, into lassitude. Mm -hmm. So as we face, you know, we're, we're, it's, it's almost winter time out there. It's getting colder every day. Yeah. Yep. Daylight savings, right? It gets, it's um, yep. dark so early yep. and that's hard for a lot of people. And now yep. we're looking at, you know, surges in COVID numbers. So it doesn't look like it's going to be the winter we maybe had hoped it, it no. would be. So 
what what else can you advise us to do? What kind of strategies can we do to, you know, I guess stay active, you're saying, try yeah. to see people, get out despite the, the yeah. risks, get vaccinated, wear a mask. Yep. What what else can we do to exercise? Um, exercise is very, very helpful with, with depression. I mean, it's it's part of the vicious circle with this disease, is you know, you feel like you don't have the energy to do very much. But um, I think I quoted from Alcoholics Anonymous in my book, their idea of move a muscle, change a thought. It's, it's, it's one of their aphorisms and it's very true. We can be sunk in the de deepest depths of depression, really feeling horrible and sorry for ourselves. And yet, if we get a phone call from a friend and we get invited out, we, we, we perk up and we feel better. But we can do that for ourselves. It doesn't take a phone call from a friend. We can just get up and move around. We can turn on some music and dance. You know, we, we, we can go out for a walk, at, the, at least for the next, next month or so. Um, we, we can exercise at home. We can join a gym. We can do all kinds of things. And those things really change our moods. And we, when we're really depressed and we're feeling this pain and we feel somehow justified that yeah, life stinks and we're miserable, it can be difficult to admit that just getting up and moving around can make us feel a little better, but it does. It does, reliably so. Not every time, but most of the time. So yeah, be active. Great. Uh, what about diet? Does diet affect our um, moods, the kinds of food, foods that we eat? Yeah, um, I think, I think everybody has put on the COVID-19, right? Um, everybody's gained a few pounds. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm no dietitian, but we seek, when we're depressed, we seek comfort foods, carbs and sugars and, and uh, uh, the stuff that we remember from childhood that's really not good for us. <laughs> um, and it just really, re it puts on weight and it really reinforces the, the idea that, um, um, that uh, somehow we're uh, a victim of a cruel fate and, and we, we, we're entitled to eat a half gallon of ice cream. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a deception. It's, it's, it's not so. We're, the ice cream is gonna, just going to make you feel worse when you crash. And we have to understand that. We have to eat carrots instead. We have to. But it does feel the, so good when you're spooning it into your mouth. It does. Yeah, feel it good. does. But we can make we can make good, nutritious meals. And, uh, that's what the new cuisine is all about. And really, there are fantastic, wonderful new tastes out there, mm -hmm. um, and we should be open to explore them. That's great. Good advice. Um, I'm going to read you a few of the questions that are starting to come in to the okay. chat box. Um, um, similar to, I guess, my question about the winter, um, Layla is asking about advice for the holidays, which can be a tough time for so many people um, yeah. feeling alone. Um, what what advice do you have as we approach the the big the big holidays coming up? Well, I think you have to adjust your expectations. <laughs> I think I think the holidays are going to be different for for many of us. So last year, hopefully not as bad as last year, but but last year was a uh, pretty bad. Um, so really, get your expectations in, in line with reality. You, you, we, we probably won't be traveling as much as we want to be. We probably won't be seeing as many people as we used to. Our, our children and our grandson has, have moved to Hawaii. We're not, we're not going to see them. But we've been Zooming every week, more than that. Um, couple of times a week and seeing our grand grandson grow up that way. And it's really heartwarming. Mm -hmm. um, it's really a good connection. So yeah, we, we don't have the ability to see people face to face so much, but we do have all this new, new technology that allows us to keep in touch and stay connected. And we really have to do that. Mm -hmm. And yeah, as for the holidays, I, I think Being generous is a very good antidote to depression. I, I think if you can 
talk yourself into the spirit of giving and being thoughtful and kind and empathic to other people, you're really doing a lot for yourself. Mm -hmm. um, thank you. We have a question about um, teenagers taking antidepressants. Um, somebody writes that they, their 15 year old daughter was recently diagnosed with depression and has been taking Wellbutrin since last winter. Um, how do you feel about uh, children that age taking antidepressants? Um, well, two things. One, well, butrin is a little bit different from most of the other antidepressants. It's, it's not an SSRI. Um, it's probably safer uh, uh, to take than most of the SSRIs for adolescents. There have, it's, it's a controversial subject because there have been indications that some of the antidepressants do lead to increased suicidal behavior, or other self-destructive behavior among, among young people. I don't know, I frankly, I don't know how realistic that fear is, but I think, I think if I had a 15 year old and they were seriously depressed, I would get them into therapy with somebody who they can really connect with, who they can really feel held by and supported by and comfortable with. And if medication is helpful for them, give it a try, but make sure that they're, they're connected with someone, make sure that they're connected with you. Make sure that you know if, if they're having any kind of self-destructive thoughts um, um, and, and, that they're, and that they're well looked after. Do you have any advice um, for those of us in this area? It can be hard to find a therapist who has availability now, right? There's so much That's demand it. on all of your time. And I know, especially I think for um, adolescents, it can be really hard around here to find someone qualified yeah. To, yeah. Um, to treat them. Do you have any recommendations where we can turn for, for help with that? Well, locally, Greenwood's Foundation in, in Litchfield is a pretty good resource for people. Um, they uh, have a sort of a stable of people in private practice like myself who uh, they will, you, you call them, they do a, an initial evaluation and then they will link you up with someone uh, hopefully close by and someone who, who you can afford. Beyond that, psychology today has a very good directory of, of therapists. Um, and that's easy. Just get on their website and, and you'll get directed to everybody. Everybody I know is uh, on psychology today. So y y what there is, you can find that way. And of course, referrals from friends, um, clergymen, doctors, these, these are all useful. Uh, referrals from other people in the helping professions, you know, Nursing, nurses, uh, those are all way, good ways to go. What about, um, you know, there's an ad on TV with Michael Phelps, the swimmer, and he's yeah. advertising this uh, service where you can, you know, you're uh, somehow they match you with a therapist who could be, I guess, anywhere and you don't meet them in person. Um, what about something like that? Well, there's a lot of therapy going on online. I mean, um, and, uh, most of my work is now online, even with people who live fairly close by. I, I think, I mean, the jury's out. I think it can be very effective to, to make these online connections. I, I know it can be. I've, I've had good luck with a number of people. Um, I don't know about Michael Phelps's service. Um, I, I can't say yay or nay about that. But I, uh, um, I, I think there's got to be a big advertising budget behind that. So I would wonder uh, just how much the profit motive interferes with um, the delivery of services there. Um, I, I think if you have great insurance, it's probably a good resource for you. But if you don't, if they probably won't be very helpful. Mm -hmm. Um, Anne has asked um, if you have any thoughts on the use of herbs and supplements, um, St. John's wort and ginkgo, for example, for treating depression. Yeah, I don't know about ginkgo. Um, 
that's um, that's a, that's a subject I, I was not. I just really sort of escaped my attention, but St. John's Wort and uh, this herb called Sammy, I, I forget what that stands for, have both been used for depression. St. John's Wort, they say, has many the same active ingredients as some of the SSRIs or SNRIs. I understand there's research been done in, in Europe on the effectiveness of, of St. John's wort that looks promising. Uh, problem is that in Europe, the things like St. John's wort are, are um, regulated by the government. So if you buy um, 10 milligrams of St. John's wort from Bayer or whatever the German company is, you know you're getting a reliable dose uh, in the U.S., there's no regulation on these things. So, you know, Nature Maids um, St. John's Wort may have five times the amount of uh, active ingredient as what comes in from another brand. And we don't know this. And Nature Made is probably not very consistent in how they create these pills. So it's, you know, I know some people have found these things to be very effective. On the other hand, I had a patient who I prescribed fish oil once for, because fish oil is supposed to be very good for energy. She didn't sleep for three days after I simply just asked her to take one fish oil tablet. So, you know, it's, it's, it's very much hit or miss. I see, um, we have a question. Um, Thoughts about medication-resistant depression treatments such as ketamine and TMS? Yeah. Um, I think ketamine is a promising avenue. I know that there's a lot of research being done on it at Yale. Um, and it seems to be um, sort of a, a no-brainer. I mean, ketamine is, is the drug of euphoria. Um, so it, it, it's supposed, I mean, on the street, it's supposed to make you feel really good. So it probably has some effect on mood disorders. There was an article in the New York Times last week or the week before about how it's being prescribed more freely now than it used to be. It used to be you have to go into a doctor's office, get an infusion and stay there under observation for a full day practically, and do that once a week for six weeks. Now it's being prescribed more loosely. And um, I, th I think it may show promise. As far as you know, transcranial magnetic stimulation, um, I don't know. I, you know, there's again, There's tremendous money behind that idea. There has been research showing that it has no effect whatsoever, but that doesn't stop it being promoted. Um, it just keeps on keeping on like the ever ready bunny. Um, so I'm kind of skeptical about that. Um, ECT, electroconvulsive convulsive therapy is still often being used and it seems to be helpful for some people. I, I'm afraid of it myself. I, 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 I wouldn't want to try it myself, but, and I know some horror stories about it, but I, but I also know some people who have been helped. So, you know, we, one author I like said, there are roughly the same number of synapses in the brain as there are molecules in the universe and we're just just at the very beginning of trying to understand how the brain works and you know many of these drugs and other approaches are are in my opinion they're, they're sort of blunt instruments to a very delicate object um so i believe in psychotherapy holly i think you have a question 
Yeah, it was just a, a general question about, uh, we understand that a lot of the, <coughs> excuse me, the, medic, the medication routes aren't consistently effective. Are there consistently effective approaches that you would suggest that don't rely on medication? Sure. Um, there's, there's several approaches to, in psychotherapy that have uh, achieved reliable results. Cognitive behavioral therapy, um, mindfulness-based psychotherapy for depression, interpersonal psychotherapy for depression, a couple of other ways to go. Um, if you're doing something like looking on um, the Psychology Today website, I'd look for someone who has training in, in, in one of those methods because that, well, for one thing, it means they've taken the trouble to get some advanced training beyond their graduate degrees and they've learned a, a, a technique that's very helpful in many cases. So it says good things about the practitioner and, and they have some techniques that may, may be very helpful for you. But and I'm, are... I'm, I'm sorry, I'm just Go gonna, that, that, so that also probably involves developing a, a sort of an ongoing trusted relationship with a, oh, a yeah. therapist of some sort. Oh yeah, oh yeah. yeah. Therapy is really about, about trust. It's really about opening up. I mean, um, as, as I said, we have defenses that keep us from seeing the mistakes we're making and the false assumptions that we have and the distortions of reality that we have and the, and the way our emotions affect our thinking. And it takes a lot of, a, a great deal of a trusting environment to help us begin to see ourselves more objectively, more reasonably uh, than, than we typically do. What about um, group therapy um, versus individual psychotherapy? I can't find group therapy anymore. Um, I was in a group, I, I thought it was powerful. Um, but that was 40 years ago. Uh, I, group, is, group is very effective treatment. And you know, if people go into a day hospital program, um, that's one place where you can find group therapy. If you have severe depression, if you're really laid low by it, I think um, a day hospital program is, is a good one, is a pretty good alternative. And it's not, it's not like a hospital, it's you know, four or five hours a week, four or five days a week of counseling, uh, training, uh, coaching, group therapy, uh, just an intensive program. And I, I think that's what people, that can be very, very helpful for people. Um, we have a question in the chat. What is the effect of cannabis on depression? Nobody knows. Um, nobody knows for sure. I, I have... I have a couple of guys I'm, I'm seeing now who have, have uh, who are really cannabis dependent and it's uh, led them into lives of isolation. Um, and I think, and they're pretty depressed partly as a result of, of, of their isolation. Um, the cannabis helps them get through the day but it's not much of a life that they have. On the other hand, occasional use um, is, is like occasional drinking. You know, it, it may, might help you feel better. It might help you socialize a little bit more, might help you loosen up. Um, it can be helpful, but as far as the chemical interaction goes, I don't think anybody, anybody knows just read something very distressing in Scientific American about cannabis use during pregnancy leading to anxiety and uh, disorders and ADHD kind of disorders in, in a child. Um, I, uh, that, that seemed to be a very well-researched study and I, I found it pretty scary. Have other questions um, either you could put them in the chat box or raise your hand. You know, Gretchen, I'll just add the, the uh, 
reference you made early on, Dick, to uh, the 10% happiness guy. That's Dan Harris. Yeah, Dan Harris. And, yes. And thank I, you. I heard him speak at a conference a couple of years ago, and he's he's really a compelling kind of like, I, I hate to use the word accessible, but you just kind of, you kind of buy his premise. It, it was really, he, he was, he's a really good speaker and, and a clear communicator. And it's like, yeah, it makes a lot of sense. I found him really effective. Yeah, I, I, I found him appealing. I mean, he, 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 the reason why it's called 10% happier is he kind of says, you know, you're not going to make yourself over from the ground up. Life is yeah. full of ups and downs, but probably you could be 10% be happier if you practice good habits and stop some of the crap you're doing to yourself. Yeah, yeah he's kind of a... Um... Uh, a, a mainline mainstream culture star on the on the uh, mindfulness circuit i think which yeah. is terrific yeah 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 we have uh, another question here which do you feel is more effective cbt or dbt and what is the difference of these two therapies uh, okay cognitive behavioral therapy versus dialectical behavior therapy um um, cognitive behavior therapy was originally developed as a treatment for depression and anxiety. And it really has to do with um, getting you to look very carefully at, at how you think. Uh, you know, it, it's, truth is, depressed people have many thinking habits in common. They, they, they are, tend to be pessimists. They tend to expect the worst. They tend to um, blame themselves for a lot of things that are not responsibility. They, they think that bad things in life are permanent and pervasive and their own damn fault. And they think that good things in life are temporary and very limited in, in scope and just the result of blind luck. Uh, th those, those are some of the cognitive distortions and depression that CBT tries to address. CBT has been broadened out so that it also addresses anxiety and interpersonal issues and et cetera. Dialectical behavior therapy or DBT was originally for, developed for people who have what's known as borderline personality disorders. That's a, that remains a pretty controversial diagnosis, whether that's, that's a real thing or, or not. It's, but to the extent that it is real, it usually involves some pretty distressing kinds of things, moods that are mood swings that are kind of out of control, self-destructive behavior that can be pretty, pretty bad, pretty damaging, a lot of difficulty in interpersonal relationships, a lot of in, uh, sort of white-handed intensity versus rage and 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 icy rejection. So it, it's it's a pattern of life more than a, a more than a group of symptoms like depression is dbt is pretty effective um there's been good research to to show that it's it can can really be helpful it's also broadened its scope so it's it's offered to more people than just those who are diagnosed with um, um by excuse me um, it's, it's, it's also helpful now you find with people with bipolar disease, uh, bipolar depression, uh, uh, with people who, have, who are suffering from post-traumatic stress disorder. Um, so it's a very useful approach. And really, I, 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 you know, if you're looking for a therapist, I, I, I think it partly depends on what you think you've got, um, what the problem is. Um, they're, they're both can be effective. I think, I think good therapy offers more than a set of techniques. It's a relationship. It's a place where you can feel it's safe to be open, where you can feel understood, where you can feel kind of supported. Um, so that should be an element in, in either of these forms of treatment. Great. Um... We have a question here. Thoughts about the use of melatonin to aid sleep? Yeah. Well, what I said before about um, St. John's wort and other herbal remedies uh, also applies to melatonin. It's there. It's not regulated by the FDA. Um, I uh, so. 
one brand may says it contains 10 milligrams of melatonin another brand says it contains five milligrams i don't know if those are, if those are really valid dosing guidelines or not i understand that much of what's on the market is really too strong that people people find about three milligrams of melatonin helpful for sleep um, and that more than that is is too much but but that's just what i've been told i don't know that for a fact do um other species um share our um depressive tendencies uh do an are there animals mammals that um feel depression i think so yeah, yeah. i mean well Depression, depression is, I mean, all of, I, we really haven't defined depression here tonight. And we really don't need to because we all know what it feels like. It, we all have rotten days, right? I mean, we, we all get in, we all have bad experiences. We all have losses. We feel sad. When we feel sad, we can, it, it can quickly turn into a, 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 a depressed mood, hopeless helpless, feeling like things will never get better. Um, the thing is that for many people, when it's just suffering a loss, you do get better. You may think you won't, but you do get better. For those people who are prone to depression, it stays with you and, and, you, um, and you're stuck that way. I think we can see in pets um, that there's a grieving process that goes on. They they stop playing, they uh, they don't they withdraw into themselves when they when they lost the connection with somebody who's really been important to them. Um, I don't think animals. Well, I think animals can rebound more quickly than 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 we can. I, but I certainly think that animals, in shelters, uh, not to run down shelters, I think they're very useful. But I, th I think we can see that many of these animals in shelters and zoos are depressed. And I don't think that's anthropomorphizing. I, 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 think, it's, uh, I think it's a real thing. It's, it's a depression is a biological condition. It's, it's, it gets into our brains. The problem is, you know, we, we tend to think of our brains as sort of kind of one way street. We get this brain at birth and we're, and it, it's, uh, we're stuck with it. Uh, but the truth is the brain is a very plastic organ. It really changes it, it, with our experiences. So, I mean, the whole idea of psychotherapy is that if we change our experiences, we can change our brains. So we can reverse the damage that the depression has, has, has inflicted on us, but it takes a lot of practice. It takes a lot of encouragement. It takes steady application of really good living habits. That's, uh, that's really interesting um, about, about other animals. Um, we have time for just a couple more questions. There's one here in the chat. What do you think about people who see a psychiatrist online every three months and are given a questionnaire in relation to the renewal of their medications? Well, I don't know. That doesn't seem ideal to me. Um, I, I, I... Uh, if people are happy with their medication regimen, if they feel like they're doing well on the drugs that they're taking, okay, you could live with that. But I doubt if it's good enough treatment for, for most people. Um, I, it, it, it seems to be a bad way of, of delivering services. Truth is there are not enough psychiatrists to go around. Uh, a lot of people are, are seeing an APRN or, or, or other kind of advanced practitioner uh, for their medications. And I think that's really probably preferable to this kind of online contact. I wanted to say one more thing about, about depression. I, I think it's important to recognize that there's really two types of, of depression. Um, there's the sudden dramatic crisis it typically happens with young people um the world falls apart 
and it's typically in, involves an obvious loss. You know, they've, they've broken up their relationship. They've suffered a job loss. They can't go to school. Um, they, 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 they can't socialize. And it's typically accompanied by a lot of anxiety. They really feel like they're losing their minds. And it's really an obvious crisis. And hopefully they'll ask for help before they start to hurt themselves. But the other kind of depression is more slow and insidious. And that's what we're seeing with COVID. It really, it creeps up on you. Um, there may be some anxiety, but it's, it's not that prominent. It's just a sort of gradual stiffening of the self. It's a gradual cutting the self off from good things. It's a gradual loss of the ability to feel good. Um, and it happens, it can happen so slowly that you really don't recognize that it's happening. People and people who love you may point it out to you. They may, you may, you may get told you're awfully crabby lately. Uh, that may be an indicator. Um, or more lovingly, you may get told, you know, you're not, you're not doing the things that you know are good for you. You should listen to that because it can, it can really sneak up on you. All right, I have one last question here for you. When a person begins to recover from a depressive episode and has continued to make life changes, what advice do you give them for coping with the concern of suffering again? Um, the, the, wor the fear that uh, uh, your change the changes you made are not gonna be enough to prevent you from suffering again i don't know i think i mean i i think to some extent that's a realistic fear but because we never know what life is going to hand us I, but i do think that there there's good reason to believe that if you practice good habits of thinking feeling doing relating taking care of yourself um dealing with stress if it, those can can lead to permanent changes in, in, in the way you address life. And you can feel pretty secure that you can deal with whatever life has got in store for you. Yeah. So, it's good advice. Thank you so much. These are all really great um, insights, a really good introduction to what, what this is all about. And I think lots of great practical information you've given us that you know as we, as we head into the holidays and the yeah. winter, yeah. Um, maybe if we, we can do 10% of this, as that yeah. person says, maybe that will, will make it a little brighter this winter. So thank yeah. you so much for that. Really, really appreciate it. Don't forget, um, we have a copy of the book at the library, which you can check out and borrow. Um, and I believe Oblong also has um, copies available for sale. Yes. So um, please avail yourself of this wonderful, wonderful resource, everyone. Um, and I will just end by adding that this is annual appeal season, you probably all know you're getting lots of things in your mailbox. And um, I'm not just going to give a pitch for the library, but for all the nonprofits around here who do a lot to, um, you know, to to support people through all of these, all of these challenges and to make life a little bit um, better for everyone. So please remember the nonprofits um, as Thanksgiving approaches and um, check out our website for um, other upcoming programs and um, happy Thanksgiving, everyone. Thank you all.